Doug, are you there? Yes. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Three past the hour. Let's go and get started. <clears throat> um, skipping AIs. Community time. Anything from the community if you want to bring up? All right. Not hearing any. Okay, How is in China? Oh, we talked a little bit about that last time. I think it went fairly well. Um, demo seemed to work, which was good. Um, any, I can't think of anything else worth mentioning. Um, we got, oh, oh, we've got a lot of good feedback from the serverless session. I'm sorry, the serverless working group session um, in terms of why people um, may be resistant to use serverless and stuff like that. Um, if you check back in the meeting minutes from last week, there should be a pointer to the, to the, to the notes that I took on that. You can read up on that if you want. Got it. Good yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, anybody else have any other comments on KubeCon China? I'm sorry, not China. <laughs> EU. Okay. Yeah, go back and check the meeting minutes last week for the link. Uh, let's see, SDK work. Um, we didn't have a meeting, but um, anybody want to mention anything from the SDK stuff? I know I actually know quite a bit of activity going on in the repos there. So is there anything anybody wants to mention? Okay, moving forward then, KubeCon China is in, I think, just under two weeks. I have put together some initial drafts of some slides, so you guys can take a look at those. Obviously, if you have any comments or questions, please ping me. Uh, there should not be any surprises in there. They're basically, for the most part, a copy of what we did in, at the uh, European KubeCon. <clears throat> and just a reminder, um, if you have an endpoint up for the demo, please give it running. I am planning on showing the demo there, assuming that it went out of time. Um, any questions or comments on that? All right, cool, thank you. Um, so in terms of incubator status, last week we talked about how uh, they did give us a definition of uh, end user, which is three users of products that, that have implemented cloud events. Um, so high level question for people, do we wanna go forward with incubator status? Um, I did check and basically all it means is uh, we get on the TOC agenda and we present our case for why we think we meet the criteria and the biggest Bit of criteria is meeting the three o the three independent end users, so we would need to actually um, uh, name names basically um, of at least three different people who are willing to say yes we use cloud events in this particular product. I don't think that'd be a problem based upon who I've heard so far supports it, but I wanted to know whether you guys wanted to go start that process now, which I can start doing, or would you rather wait until we get closer to one point zero? Any comments either way? I would just wait until 1.0. That's, that's like the gut feeling. Okay. Uh, Jim, I think your hand's up. Yeah. I, I, is there any problem with holding off for 1.0? I mean, I, I'm not quite sure what you'd say if, if you're saying people are using it, but it's not the final version or not a, not a, a prime version. Yeah, so there is no requirement for us to be at 1.0. We did check on that. And I believe the only real difference in terms of being a sandbox versus incubator is obviously bragging rights because you're a little higher up with the food chain. But we do get the ability to get more, um, what's we're looking for, uh, more of a marketing, uh, available, more marketing material available to us. So for example, we'd be allowed to uh, have our name mentioned in keynotes and stuff like that. Right now, they, they really frown upon them even mentioning uh, sandbox projects and keynotes, that kind of stuff. Or I, I think there is some other official marketing stuff available to us at that point. But from a work perspective, it doesn't change anything for us from that, from that angle. Okay. In, in that case, I would vote to, to go for the promotion then. I, we may have a use case. I, I'm not sure whether I can talk to it though. So I need to get clearance for that. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on whether we should go forward now or wait? Yeah, since, since CNCF is a very happy, marketing happy organization, <laughs> uh, get, get, getting higher up on the flagpole and uh, uh, getting more attention from the marketing machine is not bad. Um, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily a new maturity statement either. So uh, whether we are at 0 0.3 or 1.0, for me, doesn't make a difference. Uh, we should just go and climb the ladder as quick as we can. 
Okay. Um, I, I apologize. I missed. Who was the person that spoke up earlier that said they'd rather wait for 1.0? I'd like to hear your opinion in terms of why you'd rather wait. That would be. Okay. Is um, I mean, if, like, if, if we go to a one one I mean, uh, sorry, go for the, the Twitter status, right? Um, and we get more eyes on the cloud, cloud event, and we're not at version one yet. This feels that it will delay getting to work, version one even more, just because of more, uh, what do you call it, branched ideas about how things work. So I'd rather have like version one kind of concrete set set in stone, and then. <laughs> Uh, updates come in, right? So at least version one point two is not is not delayed. Yeah. Okay. So let me play devil's advocate there just for a second. If you believe that raising our status would get more eyes on there, um, would that not be a good thing? Uh, definitely a good good thing, but it will just weigh us down from getting to version one. Right. But my point is, yes, if those yes. if those but if those eyes result in changes that really should be done before we go to 1.0, wouldn't it be better to see that sooner rather than later? Definitely. I mean, yeah, it, the argument goes both ways. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying. Anybody else want to voice an opinion? Okay. Since it's not unanimous, what I'd like to do, and I, I don't think we necessarily have to rush this either, I guess what I'd like to do is um, put out more of a formal vote if that's okay with people, and and see how that turns out, and let that decide. Uh, but as I said, if it, was, if it was not unanimous, then we don't have a choice but to go forward with the vote kind of thing. Is that okay with people? Okay. Uh, but keep in mind that if we do decide to go forward, I will need names from people in terms of customers um, who are actually using it, because they uh, the TLC will want that. Okay. All right, moving forward then, um, 0 0.3. I know Microsoft, you voted through email, thank you Clemens. Is there anybody else who would like to formally vote one way or other? Otherwise, I'm just gonna ask if there's any objection like we do on most normal votes. Okay, and is there any objection then to approving the current version of all our documents as 0 0.3? All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. I will start the process of pushing that out the door. All right, 0 0.1 discussion. Um, I try to summarize where we are relative to the pull requests. And keep in mind that this is <clears throat> category, this, these categories are based upon my initial take on where the different issues and PRs fall into, right? Either required for 1.0, we should try to do 1.0, but it's not necessarily required, versus definitely a post 1.0 thing. Um, Hopefully you guys have had, a, have had a chance to look at that categorization that I did. Um, and assuming it's more right than wrong, I think this is the current layout of where things lie. So we only have basically 14 things in front of us for 1.0. And I know, I can't remember who it was on last week, somebody asked for a little more uh, concreteness relative to when we're actually gonna ship 1.0. What I'd like to do is to see how quickly we can actually attack these 14 at PRs and issues, and maybe really, really try hard to get them done within, say, two or three weeks. And what that would do then is put us in the position where we can use the remaining time uh, to sort of test out the specifications and documents, do final reviews and stuff, and start working on the, the try 1.0. And once we feel like we're done with the testing period, then we can decide whether we should say, nope, we're gonna ship right now, even though we haven't finished all those 18 open issues, or we're going to wait to resolve those. So it gives us a little bit of time to sort of do a little deeper analysis on those 18. So basically, I guess the net of what I'm trying to suggest here is we really push hard to say, try to resolve these 14 issues and PRs for 1.0 within the next, say, two to three weeks, um, and then see where we are after that relative to these outstanding try ones. But that's just an initial thought I had on the process. Anybody else want to voice an opinion? Yeah, the proposal sounds good, Doug. I think that's the way we should go. Okay. I also agree. That's the right thing. That's the right way to go. Okay. So in order to make that happen, I think the biggest issue I have is we have six unassigned issues. Um, 
the four that are assigned are these four people here. Whether you four know it or not, I did assign those four to you, <laughs> mainly because I think you guys were the ones who opened the issue. So I tagged you as working on it. Um, so out of the six that are there, I would really appreciate it if you guys in general um, looked at those and, and volunteered. Um, just keep in mind, volunteering does not mean you necessarily have to come up with a pull request yourself. It just means you're willing to do the, the, the driving, pushing, nagging, whatever you want to call it, to get her over the finish line. And the finish line could also mean to suggest we close it and do nothing with it. But I'm looking for, for six volunteers, and I won't take up time on this call to do it. But please, um, you know, if you're on the call, please look at those six and, and try to volunteer for them. Okay? Um, if I don't start seeing people volunteering over the next couple of days, I'll start doing some nagging myself, but I really prefer not to have to nag. Okay. Anything else relative to 1.0 people want to discuss? I guess I should mention there are four PRs tagged for 1.0 that need to be updated. I know, I think Clemens, you have one or two. I think I have one. I can't remember who the other one is. But uh, if you do have a PR out there that needs to be updated, please take a look at it. Yeah, I have one. I have one, which is the uh, the SDK guidelines thing, and I think that's something we need to talk through in the SDK group. Yeah, and I think we have a meeting scheduled for next week after this call. Yeah. So we should definitely discuss it then if we don't get it resolved before then. All right. Anything else on one point you want to talk about? All right. Moving forward then. So during my review or, or categorization exercise for those three groups, I then came across these four issues that I'm proposing that we close, um, either because they no longer apply or based upon the sentiment of the group, I didn't think people were gonna buy into it. In particular, the last two, um, I don't think people wanted a method attribute because that sort of exposes the transport layer based on everything ever in the past. It seems like the right way to go. Receipt queue sounded awfully close to the partition key example or an example, extension we redefined. So it seemed like a duplicate. I don't think we need a system architecture doc anymore. I think we're pretty much underway and our primer covers a lot of that. And I haven't heard anybody complain about the fact that we do the, the plus JSON thing in our MIME types. So I'm assuming that uh, we could probably close that one, and if someone does decide it is an issue, they can reopen the issue if they wanted to. So anyway, those, that was my reason for those four. Any comments or questions on those four issues? Okay. Is there anybody who would like either more time or objects to closing those four? Okay, cool. In that case, uh, um, just a reminder, if you believe that we closed one incorrectly, uh, we can't reopen it. Don't feel like we can't. Uh, the only, usually we do require a little bit of, of, uh, of a bar that just says if there's new information, right? If there's nothing new and you just want to open it just because, that might be a hard sell. But if you have new information that makes it so we should revisit our previous decision, then that's a usually a good enough reason to reopen. All right. All right, moving forward. Now this one is, oh, before we get into the PRs, is there any high level other topic people wanna to bring up? All right, cool. Um, now this PR is not technically tagged as 1.0. However, it's been out there for such a long time, I feel really, really guilty, not at least bringing it up here. Um, so it's the Kafka transport binding. I don't wanna go through it completely right now, um, but I did wanna ask Clemens in particular, because I think you have, done the most recent review of it. Do you have anything in here that you think is worthy of bringing up for people's attention? Because I think most of the issues, or I'm sorry, most of the comments you made were relatively minor, more syntactical in nature more than anything else. Are there any high level issues or concerns you think might be worthy of bringing up to the group at this point? No, I think, I think the, the uh, uh, this has been updated with uh, the, a hint for the callback mechanism. I don't don't like how the partition key is being created, and that's sufficient. I think the uh, um, yeah that that one, um, and then uh, I, maybe the prefixes are a little long, but that's cosmetic. But otherwise, um, that just seems fine. The only um, since the Kafka messages the message structure is relatively simple, and doesn't even have a you know, a notion of content type, and we're introducing that with a custom header. Um, that's, I think that's all very reasonable. So I don't see, um, I, I think people who are implementing a Kafka um, 
client on top of existing Kafka libraries would be able to go and, and implement using that. And that's, uh, and that's the bar that we have. So that's fine. Okay. And, and I apologize, uh, Neil, I completely forgot that you're on. Is there anything you'd like to mention relative to the PR that people might want to think about as they're doing a review? Yeah, no, I mean, thanks, thanks, Clemens and, and Doug for making the updates today. I had one question um, probably for you, Clemens, is I put in the key attribute um, section there. I don't actually define any precedents on whether a partition key should override the use of a key extractor. Um, or whether they're mutually exclusive or not. I, I kind of presumed, um, and I guess this is a bit of a, a gray area, I, I presume that the partition key would take precedence if one was provided, um, and then falling back to the partition key extractor. But I don't really know what the semantics should be. That's just my presumption. I think uh, Gunnar, he mentioned that on the, the other partition key uh, PR as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, since partition so i would always i would i would construct it in a way that you always have a function and and one and one uh the default function looks for that key that key and um uh and makes that the partition key and then you can write another extractor function that then goes and looks at, at different criteria criteria wow. that's that's how we'll probably go and do that Yep, that makes sense. Which means, which means the specification per se will always talk about the extractor function. Yeah. And then, and then you can effectively point to the extension and say, "Here's this is what the this is what a function could do," but yep. don't, don't be prescriptive. And you might go and add an example, expand that a little bit more, and and, and add an example here. That's that's how I would approach it. Like, yeah, that there's. There's no preconceived notion of what that P key should be. It's always a product of a function, and and the you know, proposal is that that there's a function that looks at that key and that's it. Okay, so I'll, I'll put in a, a note on the key attribute about a default uh, key extractor that looks for the partition key, um, yeah. and then people can provide their own to provide other kind of semantics. And and for the partition key, so I, I wonder in that case. Um, whether a implementation would um, um, actually go and strip as it has evaluated that partition key because it's it's then you know, used up, um, whether it would strip it. Yeah, I did wonder that too. So that's the. I think there's that you can you can you're right. You can put a little bit more meat there in that um, in that section to explain how that works, and that would make the the, the function the function is the mechanism and then there's multiple implementations and one of the default implementations is to, is to rely on that yeah okay. otherwise yeah. otherwise I would otherwise I would just go and, and tighten up the uh, the prefix because I think we, we yeah. shortened it also up to CE, to, uh, CE and HTTP um, I think I I'm not sure whether I already did that for MTP I might so go and, and do that yeah. just make a change but um, yeah that's otherwise it looks good. Cool. All right. Anything else, Neil? No, I'm good. I'll make those changes. Um, I'll have them first thing. It's UK evening here, so I'll have them first thing tomorrow. Okay, not a problem. <clears throat> um, anybody else on the call have any questions or comments about this PR? Okay. Is there any reason to think that once those edits are done, people will need more time or will have an objection? Just want to get these things out sooner rather than later. Okay, so um, yeah, so Neil, if you can make those changes, we should be able to pretty much approve this one really quickly next week then I would assume, assuming no one finds anything major, which would be really cool. Okay. All right, cool, thank you guys. Um, all right, V10 PRs. So let's get this one going. So I believe his name is Gunnar. Uh, that's just a typo. Yeah, so he wanted to change the definition of any ever so slightly. I think his biggest concern was um, it didn't include the UI reference or timestamp in there. <clears throat> now I know this actually is gonna probably overlap with hopefully a soon to come PR uh, from an issue that James Roper mentioned. But in the meantime, I wanted to at least get this one out there to see what people thought. 
in particular, Clemens, I think since you wrote the type section, I wanted to get your take on what you thought about something like this. Clemens, are you still there? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 let me read it. <laughs> so you guys don't read this stuff before you go to bed every night? I'm shocked. No, no, it's not that I have it all in my head all at the same time. Um, yeah. uh, what's the change? Like I said, I think the biggest change is the added URI reference and timestamp. I believe oh, okay. most everything else is the same. Just a uh, moving around of text, I think, more than anything else after that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, instead of, we could, we could basically say, we, this could also say, you know, can take the shape of any of the other types so that we only have to keep updating this section, but um, that's certainly right. Yeah, and, and actually what's interesting is I think that's directly related to the uh, issue that James Roper opened up. So we'll talk about that, I think, in another pull request to pretty much broaden this to be like just any, um, any binary thing. Um, Okay, but in the meantime, I think this one sounds okay uh, from your perspective. Is there anybody else on the call who has any concerns or comments on this, about this one? Okay, any objection to approving this? All right, cool, thank you guys. All right, next one. <clears throat> okay, this one's mine. I was, as I was going through the spec, um, over the weekend, I noticed that the description of timestamp is actually kind of vague. Um, in particular, the use of the word event, it isn't clear to me, or it wasn't clear to me whether that meant when the occurrence happened or when the uh, cloud event producer converted the original event into a cloud event. And so what I tried to do is to make it clear that ideally, um, it would be when the timestamp, of the timestamp of when the occurrence actually happened. Um, however, I did want to leave an out for people who maybe cannot um, determine that, but still wanted to include a timestamp so that the receiver could do some sort of time-based ordering if it made sense for them to do so. And so I, I basically said that you're allowed to use other things such as the current time, but the event producer must be consistent for the same event source. Because uh, what you don't want to have happen is if you have two event producers for the same event source where one is using current time and one is using the the, uh, the occurrence time, which is typically going to be before the current time, then things are potentially going to be out of order or at least inconsistent relative to what time the receivers are going to see for this stuff. And so I try to make it clear that they have to be consistent with the algorithm they use uh, for determining the time. And I want to see what you guys thought about this. I like this dog. <laughs> you sound surprised, Clement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I it's a, but it's coming. It's it's a it's such a great uh, improvement. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jude, for the plus one. Anybody else have any comments? I know there are a couple of LGTMs in the issue itself, or the PR itself. So thank you for those. Anybody have any questions, concerns? Okay. Any objection to approving then? All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. Glad that was easy. All right. Um, now, right now, the normal pattern we have in these calls is I usually focus on PRs because obviously those are the most important. People put in work to actually expect changes. I want to get those in there and uh, they'll make them wait. But just a heads up, um, because we're running low on PRs for 1.0, in fact, those are the only two that, um, that we actually have in front of us. Um, what, I will, what I may do next week, depending on the list of issues, is that we might actually start a discussion on some of the bigger 1.0 tag issues just to so help move the issue discussion along if I feel like it needs it. Um, it obviously, if you think I included something on the list or, or, or by mistake or I missed something that should be there, feel free to add it yourself to the agenda. Um, but I just want to give you a heads up that we may start talking about issues next week and not just pull request, even though I really, really prefer talking about pull request. I have a I have a question into the group that I see the uh, on, on the next item here the Avro format uh, which I'm supportive of. Um, is does anybody care about having something that's a you know, tagged binary format like Cbor and having a spec like for this because that's that's the most direct mapping we would have from from JSON into something that's binary and compact. 
without needing any schema or um, etc. So if anybody would be interested in that, that's a that's a um, spec that I would still be interested in getting into the, the spec set. Anybody have any comments on that? Not hearing any. So I'm going to interpret that as no objection. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. If you want to do the work, I think add more, adding more specs would be good, like that, or adding more transports would be good. Yeah, so it's it's one of the it's one of those things where I think that um, having a a compact little um, schema less encoding um, to complement JSON as an option would be super useful. And between, I mean, there's a few options that we have for those: it's message pack and Cbor, but Cbor is an IETF RFC, so even though it's less popular. Um, it's it's well implemented and it's a standard that we can rely on rather than just being a, um, a project thing. So I like I like things that have you know specs to point to. So um, I would yeah. I, now there's a question: Grace Apache Thrift G, or gRPC and Apache Thrift. So G, gRPC doesn't have an encoding. Protobuf and is one. Thrift has one, um, and uh, we can always add add some, but uh, specifically something that's a fairly direct binary representation of the JSON model um, would be something that I would think is, uh, is useful. So yes, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to find the time to write the necessary variation of the JSON. It's effectively going to be a, va a variation of the JSON um, uh, format for C4. Cool. Sounds good. All right. And with that, Let's jump into the Avro one. Now, I, I got to be honest with you. I know nothing about this protocol. Is, does this fall into the category of a community standard, or was this going to fall into the proprietary group? Or does the author want to speak? Does anybody know? I don't think Fabio's I, I on the call. I do know, but I'm, I'm just. I... Yeah, I don't, I don't think Fabio's on the call, so go for it. Okay, so so Avro is the Apache Avro is the format that the entire. Um, Hadoop stack is using for encoding data and for and for RPC internally. So there's a Avro is both an encoding format and a um, RPC framework. Um, and as encoding format, for instance, we use it in the product to archive events. So effectively, um, our event hub is like is Kafka like and also has a Kafka protocol head. And um, we spool out events from our log into binary packages and store them into storage. And we do that, for instance, using Avro. So Avro is a super compact format that is really good also for time series data because it runs very, very uh, small. And it's also why it's um, uh, popular with analytics. So effectively, if you're using uh, anything from the Hadoop stable, then um, you will be able to use um, Avro as is. And the, the, the um, advantage of Avro is that it's, it is quite compact. And there are multiple. And, and, it also, and, and it also has the advantage that it can carry its own schema. So they have a based schema language. Um, and you can go and create a container with Avro where you package the schema up front, and then you read the schema, then you have everything that you need to uh, decode the following binary. Um, so that's that's also a thing. So you can do, use you can use it with embedded schema or without embedded schema. It's fairly it's fairly um, uh, flexible. And there are multiple implementations of it. Huh? And there are multiple implementations. Yeah. The, so the the um, in the Apache, there's a bunch of implementations for kind of for a bunch of languages. Okay. Um, and uh, that's mostly where that all happens. So it's 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 a project it's a project in Apache. Okay. All right. In that case, um, is there anybody uh, who, yeah, yeah, Fabio, is there anybody on the call who'd like to comment on the PR itself? I haven't reviewed it yet. Yeah, I was, I was, that was my next question. Is has, has anybody had a chance to review it? So I'm I'm sympathetic to it, but I haven't reviewed it yet, so I can't say how um, how much I like it. How, how much I like the details. I like the intent. I don't know how much I like the details. Okay. Because I'd like to at least have one person admit that they reviewed it before we approve it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, would, that, that, I would insist that we do that. <laughs> at, at least one, yes. <laughs> Is there anybody in the call who would like to admit that they reviewed it? 
Okay, well then we're gonna have to wait. And I, I guess the only request here is that people take time to at least review it. Um, personally, I, I, I apologize. I have not had a chance to review it myself either. So. No, there's a typo right on line 94. 94. Oh. Thank you. I'm, I'm with Clemens on this. I mean, yeah, I completely agree we need it. Um, I'm completely maxed out for the next week or so, though. Otherwise, I would, I would have to jump in. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, I don't think we necessarily have to review this or not have to put it right away. Obviously, I tag it as post 1.0. I'm sorry, as a try for 1.0, I believe. Because um, obviously, it's not necessarily required, but the more we get into it, the better. So, um, you know, obviously, fit it in as you guys can, uh, but it's not urgent for 1.0. Right. Any other things we want to talk about relative to this then? Okay, so it sounds like we just need to find time. Cool. All right, next one is mine. So I'll let you guys read this. Just wanted to add a little bit of clarity around type. I'm trying to remember why I wrote this one a minute. Oh, I think I wrote this because I was, hold on a minute. I was trying to address issue 188 and um, <clears throat> they were, I think they were a little confused as to whether type was related to the actual occurrence or of the cloud event itself or something like that. So I just wanted to add a little clarity here that this is related to the, um, the occurrence itself and there actually could be more than one event related to the occurrence. Um, but anyway, they said this, this actually contains the value describing the type of the event related to the original occurrence. So I tried to tie it back to the occurrence itself. I don't know. It's no, there's nothing normative in there. There's no must or anything like that. But I tried to address it as best I could. If you want, what I could do is go back to the original issue. If you guys want to see that, what they were questioning. Yeah, so you can read this. There was the original question. Right. I don't know. What do you guys think? Is it, does it try to address his concern? Is it okay? Hate it? Keep it the way it was? What do you guys think? Jude, you're up. I like the fact that uh, it specifies that one or more events can be generated with the same type. Yeah. It's not evident like, from the previous description, so I like the new description much better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's funny. If anything, I, I thought that was actually a more critical piece because <laughs> it made it clear it wasn't necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. But there is a, the, the, the source, multiple things can happen to the source, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so you you know you know state you know state that the, the 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 differentiation between different events is necessary because one occurrence can cause multiple events. I think I think the the differentiation between events is necessary because the source multiple things can happen to the source. Um, you mean multiple occurrences, right? Yeah, multiple multiple kinds of occurrences can happen inside of the source, each having its own its own kind of event. And yes, there's a spe there might be a special case where a single occurrence might fire off multiple different events. Mm -hmm. But but now what what you formulated here seems to motivate the type by a single occurrence having different events fired because of it. Okay, I'm not quite sure I see that, but is there a wording change you'd like to see? Or do you think the original text is more clear? What, what would you suggest? Well, you constrain, you, you, you're, you're introducing a const what seems like a constraint. Yeah, like okay. You're anchoring it, you're anchoring it to, to um, how shall I say? 
Um, yeah, what's the constraint you think I'm introducing? Because that definitely was not my intent. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's like you, you're tying, it's now it seems to me like one or more events might be generated as a result of these events. That is, that is the, and now you try to differentiate events be, because of the fact that you have mo, mo, multiple events resulting from that occurrence, that's why you need to have that type. And I don't think that's true. That's what that now telegraphs to me. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying, okay, so let me rephrase that to make sure I understand. You're saying that the current wording applies to you, that the entire reason we have type is because we have, might have more than one event from an occurrence. Yes. Got it. Interesting. That's, that's what that says to me now. And it Interesting. should. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, if I was to reorder those two sentences that I added, would that change it? Jim has a has a proposal. It's, it's right. Right. Yay! I like that better. Okay, I, I can, I'm okay with that. What do other people think? So, Jim, I assume you are <clears throat> suggesting to replace these two sentences with that one, correct? Well, I guess I was okay with the original language, um, but if if we wanted to extend it a bit more, I, I think I agree with the more I was listening to Clemens, I, I sort of understood where he was going. Um, it, yeah, I know what we're trying to say is that stuff happens and this is how you identify what that stuff is um, and, and, a, and a source can emit lots of stuff. Yep. So just a quick question, the may here. Uh, you, yeah, all right, should, yeah, does, maybe. That's what I was wondering, whether you want it to be normative or not, okay. Yeah. Uh, or, the type, or, wait, or wait, wait. Yeah. The type is used, yeah. yeah. Okay, or yeah, is used, I like that. What do people think about that new wording? I mean, you can read that. Sometimes bold. All right. Any objection to that new wording? Okay. Um, I mean, actually, so, hold on. So I was going to say. I mean, I I still think we need the language of you know it is to define the type of the event. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the fundamental purpose. Yeah. So I quickly. think I agree with that statement too. This is Mehmet. I don't think this, this statement is really adequate. Uh, you have to define it, the UN types. Whether it is uh, ad admitted or it is received, doesn't matter. You should have the UN types. So, Mehmet, I'm not, I, you cut out there a little bit on me. Which part of the sentence are you worried about? I think you're saying that the, it's used to distinguish why the event was emitted, right? Um, and I assume this is one use of type. In other words, type could be used for other things too. So uh, the question is really, have we defined the event type somewhere to begin with? And therefore, it doesn't have to be whether it is emitted or received. It doesn't matter what you do with the event. I, I think I see what's going on here. Maybe. Right on maybe. Here. Maybe it's more in terms of the type is used to sort of categorize the event rather than distinguish. Maybe distinguish is a, is a strongly loaded term. Yeah, I think categorize is a better word. That's for sure, yeah. What do people think about that? Yeah, the, word, the, the, the use of the word why was kind of bothering me. Clemens, you okay with that? Yes, yes, I am. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? I, I maybe switch those statements around. You know, the type is used to categorize the event and sources may emit multiple events. But I don't know. I, I'll let you wordsmith that. <laughs> well, we're going to have to approve it because I, I think it's a small enough we could probably approve it right now, one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody okay? Everybody okay with that? All 
Okay. Any? Ob oh, Jude, your hands up. Yeah. Um, if if you read it out in a sentence out loud, it doesn't read correctly. The type is used to categorize the event. Sources may emit multiple events. Would that help? Um, yeah. yeah. Sure. What about that? No, I, I want to drop the word occurrence. Yeah. Just really? Drop the word occurrence. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So, Why? I, well, I, I think this comes back to the categorization thing. Um, if you have, I don't know, um, uh, an IoT sensor, and that sensor is going to emit events when something happens to it. Now, you could either say that the type says, activated or deactivated or the type could just be sensor yeah um so sometimes it's categorizing and that enables you to interpret what's going on and sometimes it's very very prescriptive of what's going on um but an occurrence a thing probably only emits one event a source may have multiple occurrences but an occurrence is a singular thing. Um, okay. I'm pushing it now. But. Well, okay. I think Scott's right. We should probably take this to GitHub because it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. I, I don't think it's a minor wording change because um, I'm not, the more I think about it, the less happy I am with this because in general, obviously that's true. Sources can emit multiple events, period. Um, if if <clears throat> I, I thought this the multiple aspect of this was going to be related to a single occurrence, but if that's going to be up for discussion, then we should take it back to the GitHub issue. So let, let's let's defer this um, since we have other PRs that don't require necessarily wordsmithing. Okay, but it did a good discussion. Um, so the next one, I don't necessarily want to or try to approve today. I just want to draw your attention to it. Uh, some of us were talking uh, at KubeCon EU about how it would be really nice if we actually gave some guidance on how to write what I was calling adapters, which means for popular events that are generated out there today, how do you convert them into cloud events? That way, in case there are multiple implementations of those adapters, at least have some consistency across them so you get interop. And that way, regardless of which adapter a particular receiver uh, gets their messages sent through, they should hopefully get the same cloud event at the receiving end. So what I did is I wrote um, three different adapters, one for GitHub, one for GitLab, and one for AWS SNS, and just basically put down what I thought would be the right way to map it based upon the data that was being sent along. As I said, um, I'm not gonna push to do this today because to me these files are rather large. I mean, the GitHub one didn't even show unless you hit the load diff. Um, but please take a look when you get a chance. In particular, the source and subject ones were not 100% clear to me. Um, there were times when I could have been, con when, I, when I had an option of being consistent with other events that are kind of related to this versus more purist in terms of what value I chose there. And I wasn't quite sure which way to go. I did comment on this in the issue or in the PR description itself. So please read that when you get a chance. Um, but anyway, like I said, I'm not gonna ask people to review it right now, um, but I do wanna get that in there sooner rather than later if possible. And so please review it when you get a chance. Uh, Jude, your hand's up. Um, over time, we'll have hundreds, if not thousands of adapters. Is that the intention? As I say that one more time, you can cut out a little there for me. Over time, right? We'll have like a, like a ton of adapters, at least hundreds, if not thousands. Is that the intention for the adapters for? So are you, are, you, are you asking whether we're going to try to have all possible adapters in the world put into our repo? Uh, one, yes, but uh, more than that, I think many people con contribute adapters, which is really good, but uh, soon it will grow out of hand and become like thousands, right? Yeah, so it, it is not my intent that every single adapter in the world should try to push the, a specification to our repo. I mean, if they want to, that'd be great. I don't think that, that hurts anything. I at least wanted to get some of the common ones out there for two purposes. One is because they're very, very common. And I thought there actually might be multiple implementations of these types of adapters. Like for example, the GitHub one, I think is, is a very, very popular one. And I think there might be multiple of those. But the other piece of it is, 
I found writing these writing the PR to be an incredible learning experience. It, 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 it sort of highlighted some of the problems. Like for example, I think that's the reason why I wrote the PR around time earlier today, because it wasn't clear to me when I should be using current time versus trying to uh, dig through the event that I'm getting that I'm receiving from GitHub and try to find a particular time in there to use. And I realized if I if I made that decision differently per the event type, then the receiver is going to get different data, right? And that's why I push for that consistency aspect that we just approved earlier, right? So I thought doing this was a great exercise, one for me to make sure the spec made sense for these attributes, but also that as somebody who actually might write an adapter one day, you could look at the spec and understand exactly what goes into fields like subject. Because as I said, as I was writing this, it wasn't clear to me when I should use subject versus source for a particular field. And so I think this, if nothing else, can help educate people if they go off and to write their own adapters, even if they don't submit it to us, right? This will help them understand what we meant when we wanted to say, fill this field in with this type of value, right? Because we have examples, but I think this type of example is even more useful than just the one or two examples we have in the spec itself. Does that make sense? Yep, definitely. Okay. I like that. Okay. Um, Mehmet, did you want to say something or are you just off mute? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Okay, just want to double check. Okay, like I said, uh, please review this when you get a chance. In particular, I want to pick on Scott um, because I know you've been very heavily involved in the Knative adapters. Um, and I want to make sure that you're okay with this, with this direction, because there are definitely some choices in here that I'm not sure you'd necessarily agree with, but I wanted to uh, draw your, your attention to it and pick on you a little. Yeah, it's the same problem as, as we've talked about before, where we're not, you're not namespacing the adapter's type on behalf of the, of GitHub. Yeah. But that's, but that's a lie, right? It's not GitLab that did this type. It's, it's you that made the choice of how to do this adaptation. Right, and I think that that's one of the things I'd like to at some point have us discuss, probably initially through the PR itself, um, unless we run out of time, or unless we have a lot of free time on these calls. But <clears throat> I will mention that I did reach out to GitLab and GitHub directly to see if they'd be willing to collaborate with us on this. And in my mind, if we can get them to buy into the notion of saying, yeah, of course it should be GitLab or GitHub, then that's their way of saying, uh, it's okay for you guys to use our namespace because that's exactly what we would do if we supported this ourselves. So that's my, that's another sort of a, a backwards intention of all this was to try to get their buy-in as well. Have you gotten responses? Um, let's see, GitLab is definitely interested in, in, in participating. I, just, I think it's more a matter of time right now. And in fact, they went one step further and one of the guys suggested that maybe we should submit a pull request to have GitLab support it natively, which I thought was really cool. Uh, the GitHub folks, I made initial contact with them, thanks to Clemens, thank you very much. Um, and they, they didn't seem objected, they didn't seem against the idea, but they also didn't jump up and down and say, yeah, 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 either. Um, but in fairness, I just talked to them last Friday. So I'm still waiting for them to get back to us and I suspect they're just busy. So we'll see how it plays out. And I need to actually hit up Tim to make sure he's okay with this mapping I did here, obviously. I did send him a note, but he hasn't had a chance to respond yet, so he may be busy. I did see, uh, was it Tim opened the big issue about AWS adoption of cloud events? Did you yep. see that one? I did see that, and we did talk about that, I think, last week. Um, okay. Yeah, well, briefly we talked about it. Um, and that's another reason why I reached out to him, because I thought they may have already done this mapping, and so he could tell me where I went wrong. Cool, okay. Thanks. Yep. So anyway, like I said, not going to rush this through other than I do think it's a great learning exercise and I, I think it'd be useful for the community in general to have this kind of thing. All right. Any last minute comments on that before we move on? All right. In that case, I think this might be the last one for today. Eric, would you like to talk about your primer change for persistence? Sure, I can do that. Um, uh, way long ago, uh, Doug, you asked that uh, we bring up uh, questions that we had. In particular, I was thinking a lot about event sourcing and about writing the cloud events that I was receiving down in a log. And uh, I was thinking that there are a number of things that don't get addressed when that happens or, or kind of are subtracted from the context. Things like who sent this and what rights do they have? Uh, was it uh, not 
a modified in transit and uh, you know uh, in order to receive it I've removed the confidentiality that was used to send it you know the encrypted connection um, all these sorts of things and and there's a lot of uh, very deep considerations uh, that we could go down there um, particularly for cloud events it seems like that's and particularly in the discussions that have resulted it seems like that's not something for the core spec to address uh, certainly in 1.0 um, although uh, kind of what I asserted here is that it is expected that uh, there will be uh, extension attributes and I kind of left that extension part implied um, that will help to individuals using cloud events to address these concerns uh, without actually trying to address them in the spec itself the security and everything related to it is uh, frequently evolving um, and and changing uh, dimension of the of the field so uh, trying to canonicalize that within this spec when it's really just trying to declare how communication happens, what content and metadata is uh, important for that. Um, seemed like it, it was out of scope. So I have questions related to this. So let's say, so we're implementing um, um, a, an event store effectively, so like event hubs similar to Kafka, and that data gets persisted there. And we have a we have a mechanism today that encrypts data at rest. Um, and uh, we have in a particular SKU also a SKU also a way for you to give us a key to go and store that. Uh, to 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 control the the how the encryption works, and we have you know input authorization and output authorization who can get who can get to that data um, so we have effectively several angles of security around this but none of those however are informed by the event per se and what's in that event so what do you expect what do you expect there to be as attributes that control behavior of data on disk I, I could be wrong, but I, I, it seems to me that probably that is possible for you to do because you control the entirety of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that the definitions of how to, how to uh, uh, kind of encrypt and decrypt and, and manage the permissions have, have all been uh, made consistent through the software. Uh, if, if that were to if the the writing and the reading were being done by different parties, then there would need to be some kind of a uh, agreement over um, the, uh, the the ways that that's done. And and it could be that that's all informally agreed outside of the um, of the the kind of specification um, and outside of some sort of a standardization. But if the parties don't necessarily know uh, who, uh, you know, if they're a writer, what parties are going to read, or what uh, if they're a reader, what kind of what parties are going to write, uh, they may want that kind of support. Um, so, I, I, I mean, go ahead. Yes. So I wonder. I, I really wonder what the what the whether this whether you are not trying to hint at um, mechanisms that are um, that that kind of exist for messaging um, systems that is like um, you know end-to-end -end encryption and end-to-end -end identity because that's that's that seems where that's going because there's no difference for at least not in my mind for whether you keep a message on the wire or whether you uh, put that message into um, into into a disk and store it and do a stored forward um, because the the wire established context is something that in in in, in common pop up systems kind of terminates at the gateway, and mm -hmm. then as you, as you hand that out to to subscribers, you don't carry that that established uh, context that you have like the connection context. You don't hand that forward to the subscribers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, per perhaps another way for me to to say this is is I think that 
It's, it's a declaration that uh, that's an exercise left for implementers and that we're not going to try and solve that within the cloud event spec. Um, though perhaps we, uh, I don't want to declare that we'll never provide support. Uh, it doesn't, it seems like there's enough uh, of a need for solving this that support could be helpful, but that um, we're, we're certainly for uh, version one, not going to, to kind of dip our toes and um, yeah. I, I, that's something that I completely agree with that we shouldn't be tackling this. But it's, I think this is, a, this is a variation of a discussion we've had twice or three times um, about identity and encryption, because we have effectively, if you, if we either had PRs or issues that were specifically proposing that we introduce some notion of end-to-end -end encryption or end-to-end -end identity, and mm -hmm. we scope both of those out with um, the, you know, knowing what uh, uh, introducing those things did to other standards, um, at least at least early on, and then decided that we might want to take those on uh, post we want at some point if, if there's enough interest. And I think I think it's a worthy thing to 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 um, ultimately deal with. We just don't have the necessary infrastructure right now, standardized infrastructure right now, to deal with it because we need to have key registries. We need to be able to go and talk to those key registries. We need to have key rolling, and there's all kinds of complications that are involved. So I'm I'm so I'm, I'm wondering, it, it, reading that text. I'm not sure how much that helps me, but um, maybe it helps others. So is there specific oh, wording, Clements, that you'd like to see changed or? Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's my mindset that for me, pers persistence is a matter of like, that's something that happens all the time that I don't find that, that spe I don't think that's special. So uh, maybe that doesn't, maybe not the audience for that text. Okay. Is there anybody else on the call who'd like to voice an opinion? We have about 30 seconds left. And I'm trying to see whether we should vote now or wait. I'm inclined to say we wait just a little, because I'm not sure everybody's had a chance to review it yet. Eric, would you be okay if we wait till next week? Eric, did we lose you? Oh, I'm here. I'm happy to wait, uh, okay. and okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind uh, uh, feedback at all. Okay, cool. In that case, please, when you guys get a chance, take a look at this. It is it is in the primer, so it's not normative, but we do want to make sure the text actually accurately reflects our current thinking. All right, with that, it is the top of the hour. So one last little check. <clears throat> Did I miss anybody in the attendance list? Wow, this is old. Your name is on my, there it is, Christoph. I was wondering why your name didn't appear there. It took a second to update. Anybody else on this for the attendance? All right, cool. In that case, we are done. Thank you guys very much. Very productive meeting. Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody.